Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Multiplex Amino Assay Detection of Alzheimer's Disease Biomarkers in Febrospinal Fluid, Plasma, and Serum, presented by Anthony Taparita, a senior scientist at Millipore Sigma. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Millipore Sigma. For information about our sponsor, visit www.emdmillipore.com. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time during the presentation. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type those questions into the drop-down box that appear on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen or use that Ask a Question box to let us know you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right corner of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain those credits. Please join me now in welcoming our presenter today, Anthony Saparita. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Welcome, sir. Hello, thanks for the introduction and thanks for tuning into this webinar. My name is Anthony Saparita, and I'm a research and development scientist within the Immunoassay Platform Solutions Group at Millipore Sigma. Today I will be discussing some of the immunoassay kits we are developing to facilitate and further research on neurodegenerative disease. During this webinar, I will be covering a few topics related to the immunoassay portfolio of Millipore Sigma. First, I will provide some background on multiplex protein detection technology. Then I will talk about some of the assays we have developed for neuroscience research, specifically highlighting a new kit, Human Neuroscience Panel 2, that will launch at the end of the month. I will share some data using this kit to measure existing and emerging biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease in cerebrospinal fluid, plasma, and serum. Lastly, I will discuss one of our newest technologies, SMC, which stands for Single Molecule Counting. SMC is a high-sensitivity immunoassay that allows for protein measurement at femtogram per milliliter concentrations. We've recently launched a new instrument, the SMCX Pro, so I will provide some insight into this new platform and share some data with a new kit we've developed for it uh, for the measurement of the critical Alzheimer's disease biomarker amyloid beta-42. For well over a decade, Millipore Sigma has been developing assays using the multi-analyte profiling technology from Luminex for multiplex protein detection. Conceptually, the multiplex technology that we use is similar to a traditional ELISA, uh, with the caveats that the assay, the multiplex assay, is taking place in suspension and uh, <clears throat> One of the features is that you're able to conduct several assays simultaneously within the same sample. This is made possible by the XMAP technology from Luminex, which essentially provides a color-coded set of magnetic microspheres that can each be coded with a capture antibody and distinguished by the Luminex instrumentation. When incubated with sample and detection antibody, a sandwich complex is formed consisting of the capture bead, the analyte of interest, and the detection antibody. The addition of streptavidin phycoerythrin, or SAPE for short, uh, that's a reagent that's going to bind to the biotinylated detection antibody and tag it with a fluorescence reporter. So then proteins can be measured in multiplex fashion by two lasers, one of which will identify the bead and thereby the analyte that you're measuring, and the other that will measure the fluorescent signal associated with that analyte. We have a few different instruments capable of reading a Luminex-based multiplex assay. Uh, pictured here on the top is the Luminex 200. Uh, we also have a FlexMap 3D instrument. Uh, both of those instruments use a flow cytometry-based analysis system. And pictured below is the MagPix, which uses CCD imaging. 
our milliplex assays can be run on both types of instruments, and although the fluidics and optical components may differ, the assay principle remains the same. So what are the advantages of running a multiplex assay versus a traditional ELISA? The major appeal of the multiplex assay is the ability to measure several proteins simultaneously from a single sample. So instead of purchasing and running several ELISAs, using up sample with each experiment, multiplexing helps conserve samples, thereby saving time and money. <clears throat> and another advantage to point out is the wide dynamic range for Luminex-based multiplex assays. The figure below shows a comparison of the dynamic range of an ELISA kit for the protein GFAP versus a bead-based Luminex assay for GFAP, uh, which is from the kit Human Neuroscience Panel 1. When the ELISA standard curve is evaluated alongside the standard curve from the Luminex assay, you can see that the milliplex GFAP assay covers a much wider range with sensitivity that extends below one nanogram per mil. So when you're using these kits to measure GFAP and CSF, it, uh, and the CSF samples are represented uh, by those yellow uh, diamonds, <clears throat> it's apparent that uh, the milliplex assay can detect GFAP in the CSF samples, uh, seven out of seven samples, whereas the uh, ELISA, the range doesn't extend down far enough. You're only getting detection in three out of the seven CSF samples that were tested. So this is just one example, but in general, the range and sensitivity of our milliplex assays equals or exceeds that of an ELISA. Identifying biomarkers to include in our kits is just the beginning. We have rigorous validation guidelines to help ensure that our kits deliver reliable performance. Below is a list of the criteria that we use during kit validation. With most of our product categories, we typically validate with serum and plasma. However, most of our neuroscience panels are also validated for cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. During validation, we establish kit sensitivity and confirm that there is no cross-reactivity between analytes in the panel. <clears throat> we do this by ensuring that a capture bead directed against one protein does not bind to the protein standard of another analyte. We also test precision to ensure that, uh, to ensure that there's reproducibility uh, within the assay. The accuracy benchmark refers to spike recovery assays, where known quantities of an analyte are spiked into the samples, and then the experimentally determined values are compared to the expected values. Linearity testing determines whether the samples behave as expected over successive dilutions. Poor performance during spike recovery or dilution linearity testing can indicate potential matrix effects or other factors interfering with the fidelity of the assay. We test uh, where the samples are going to fall on a standard curve, as well as how samples are going to be affected by storage conditions. Uh, we can do that by heat stressing. We also heat stress the kit to approximate different conditions that the kit could be exposed to during the shipping process. And if there happens to be similar products on the market, we will compare, we will compare the uh, milliplex kit performance with the other assays, uh, such as ELISA's. Now that I've provided some background on the technology behind Multiplex, I will discuss our kit portfolio as it applies to neuroscience research. We have four uh, human neurodegenerative disease panels listed across the top, and these have been used extensively to study Alzheimer's disease. We also have neuropeptide panels for human, mouse, and rat. Uh, the neuropeptide panels use a competitive assay format to measure six different neuropeptides. Uh, these neurodegenerative disease and neuropeptide panels have been in the Millipore Sigma kit portfolio for several years and have been featured in numerous publications. Some of our newer kits include the human amyloid beta and tau panel and the mouse amyloid beta panel. And I'll speak more about the amyloid beta peptides and the tau protein in a few slides. Each milliplex kit is packaged with all of the components pictured here. 
including capture beads, lyophilized quality controls, and a lyophilized protein standard that is rehydrated and serially uh, diluted by the end user to generate the standard curve. Uh, it also, the kits also come with a detection antibody cocktail and SAPE solution, which is your reporter, wash buffer, assay buffer, a 96 volt plate and plate sealers, along with the kit protocol. Additionally, some assays will include a serum matrix and or a bead diluent. Next, I want to show you some data from two of the products in our neuroscience portfolio that we have recently developed. We use these kits to determine the sample range of human CSF from healthy donors and patients with neurodegenerative disease. So on the left, uh, you see the uh, standard curves for the human amyloid beta and tau panel that recognizes four targets that are amongst the most well-characterized biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease the amyloid beta-40 and amyloid beta-42 peptides, total tau, and tau phosphorylated at 3 and 181. The bottom left figure uh, provides an example of data generated from this kit showing an increase in phosphorylated tau in the CSF of Alzheimer's disease patients relative to healthy controls, uh, consistent with what's been established in published reports. On the top right, are the standard curves for analytes in Human Neuroscience Panel 1. So this kit isn't so much focused on Alzheimer's disease and instead contains analytes relevant to a few other neurological conditions. For example, Human Neuroscience Panel 1 can detect traumatic brain injury biomarkers such as GFAP and UCHL1 and Parkinson's disease biomarkers like alpha-synuclein and DJ1. One of the analytes in this panel, NSE, has been used as a biomarker for a variety of conditions. And the figure on the bottom right, we are evaluating its concentration in CSF samples from patients with Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, or healthy controls. And we did not observe significant differences in NSE levels between these conditions. However, we were able to quantitate this biomarker over a broad sample range in each patient cohort. A great resource for Alzheimer's disease researchers is the Alls Forum website, which includes a meta-analysis of Alzheimer's disease biomarkers. And I'll be referring to Alzheimer's disease uh, using AD uh, throughout this presentation. Um, this meta-analysis includes many of the proteins currently in our neuroscience product portfolio as well as some emerging targets that we were interested in developing assays for. The size of the bubbles in this figure corresponds to the number of published studies that were integrated into the analysis. As you progress up or down the y-axis uh, from the origin, you observe more pronounced differences in protein concentration between normal CSF and Alzheimer's disease CSF. As you move further along the x-axis, the observed differences take on greater statistical significance. The three most well-characterized Alzheimer's disease biomarkers are A-beta-42, total tau, and phosphorylated tau. These proteins are also critical to Alzheimer's disease pathology as the amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles that are hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease are composed of the amyloid beta and tau proteins respectively. Some of the other proteins in the meta-analysis <clears throat> that are in already present in our assay portfolio include YKL40, which is an analyte in Human Neurological Disorders Panel 3, and NSE, which is in Human Neuroscience Panel 1. This analysis also contains several proteins that we were interested in adding to our assay portfolio as part of Human Neuroscience Panel 2, uh, including two of the exciting uh, Alzheimer's disease-related proteins, uh, TREM2 and neurogranin. TREM2 is a cell surface receptor expressed on myeloid cells, such as microglia. TREM2 can be cleaved, resulting in a soluble fragment that can be t detected in cerebrospinal fluid, serum, and plasma. With increased amounts of 
TREM2 observed in Alzheimer's disease, CSF. Neurogranin is a postsynaptic protein whose levels are also increased in Alzheimer's disease, CSF, and may be a biomarker for synaptic damage. Here we show the standard curves and the analyte list for human neuroscience panel two. In addition to TREM2 and neurogranin, human neuroscience panel two contains other analytes linked to neurodegenerative disease. One analyte, prion protein, is predominantly known for its role in prion diseases in which the cellular isoform is converted to a misfolded pathogenic isoform. This misfolding propagates through the nervous system accumulating and causing neurodegenerative disease. The cellular prion protein is a surface receptor that can interact with amyloid beta oligomers, and this interaction can regulate intracellular signaling. Additionally, CSF levels of prion protein can be used to distinguish Alzheimer's disease from Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. The APOE4 allele is the biggest genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, and I will talk a little bit more about the APOE4 uh, protein isoform in the next slide. Angiogenin is a secreted RNase that stimulates angiogenesis, but has also been linked to neurological disease and ALS in particular, although increased plasma levels of angiogenin in Alzheimer's disease have also been described. FABB3 is also known as heart fatty acid binding protein and linked to cardiac function. However, several studies have shown that increased FABP3 levels in cerebrospinal fluid are linked to Alzheimer's disease. Ferritin is a biomarker of Alzheimer's disease outcomes and its expression is regulated by APOE. So that's the, the recap of uh, the analytes in this panel. And now I'm going to get into uh, the APOE4 isoform a little bit more specifically. So the human APOE protein isoforms differ from each other at only two amino acids, with APOE4 having arginines at positions 112 and 158, whereas APOE2 and APOE3 isoforms have either one or two cysteines at these positions. The alleles for each of the three APOE isoforms are present in different frequencies in healthy and Alzheimer's populations. The table below shows the frequency of the APOE genotypes and the notable increased presence of the APOE4 allele in individuals with Alzheimer's. APOE has a plethora of functions, one of which appears to be regulating, regulating uh, amyloid beta. The APOE isoforms can differentially affect clearance of amyloid beta from the brain, thereby influencing aggregation and plaque formation. In Human Neuroscience Panel 2, we employ an antibody pair with high specificity for the APOE4 isoform. The graph on the right shows a dose-dependent detection of the APOE isoforms with our APOE4 assay uh, from Human Neuroscience Panel 2. So even at very high concentrations of APOE2 and APOE3 recombinant protein, there is still less than 5% cross-reactivity with the APOE4 bead. The assay protocol for Human Neuroscience Panel 2 follows a similar format to many of our other kits for circulating biomarkers. After the plate is pre-wet in a preparatory step, the capture, bead, uh, the capture step is performed by adding capture beads and assay buffer to the standards and samples. Human Neuroscience Panel 2 is validated for CSF, plasma, and serum at a 1 to 10 dilution of each sample type. Um, so that's the dilution factor that's recommended. Um, and so because of that dilution factor, it's not necessary to use a serum matrix with this kit. For two of the analytes, however, angiogenin and APOE4, we recommend a greater dilution. Uh, one to 200 should be sufficient uh, if the user is working with plasma and serum. But for all the analytes, it's a, it's a one to 10 dilution in CSF. 
we recommend an overnight incubation at four degrees. Um, <clears throat> however, the protocol can be shortened to a one-day protocol, uh, performing a two-hour incubation instead. We recommend that once an incubation protocol uh, for the capture step is determined, though, that you stick with it throughout the course of your study for the sake of consistency. After the capture step is complete, the plate is washed and incubated with a detection antibody cocktail for one hour. For Human Neuroscience Panel 2, the detection antibody cocktail contains biotinylated detection antibodies against all of the targets except angiogenin. The biotinylated detection antibody for angiogenin is included in the bead diluent, as the standard curve for this analyte is stunted without co-incubation of the capture and detection antibodies. After one hour at room temperature for the detection antibody cocktail, the reporter solution, SAPE, is added and the plate is incubated uh, for an additional 30 minutes at room temperature. After the SAPE incubation, the plate is washed and the beads are resuspended in sheath fluid for analysis on Luminex instrumentation. So, now I'll show you some data that we generated with cerebrospinal fluid samples from a small cohort of Alzheimer's disease patients and healthy controls using Human Neuroscience Panel 2. While these studies generally need larger sample sizes, our objective here was not to publish novel data, but just to demonstrate an application of multiplex technology. For APOE4, uh, in the top left corner, only two of eight samples from the healthy control group were positive for APOE4 protein. And that's about the distribution that we'd expect based upon the prevalence of the APOE4 allele in the general population. In contrast, APOE4 protein was detected in all of the Alzheimer's disease samples. Although we did not see any significant changes in CSF TREM2 in the AD samples, we did observe increases in prion protein as well as neurogranin. Here, I used Human Neuroscience Panel 2 to evaluate serum and plasma from AD patients and healthy controls. We observed some interesting trends such as an increase in serum TREM2 and serum FABP3. Serum neurogranin was often below the minimum detectable concentration in healthy controls, but was detectable in the majority of Alzheimer's disease serum samples. We also evaluated plasma samples, although I should point out that we did not have matched serum and plasma samples, so we were evaluating uh, different patient cohorts. For TREM2, although we observed similar trends with uh, regards to the sample values uh, and the average concentrations in both serum and plasma, there was no statistically significant difference uh, between the normal group and the Alzheimer's disease group uh, in plasma. However, we did see an increase in plasma values for prion protein in the Alzheimer's disease group. Taken together, our analysis of these biomarkers shows the versatile performance of human neuroscience panel 2 in various biological samples. Another advantage of multiplex protein detection is that it is a great for data mining. We took the same CSF sample sets that we had evaluated with Human Neuroscience Panel 2, and we also ran them on the Human Amyloid Beta and Tau panel. Then we analyzed the data, looking for correlations between analytes in the normal and CSF sample sets. With Human Neuroscience Panel 2, uh, within that kit, we observed a weak correlation between FABP3 and neurogranin in the healthy control group, but a much stronger correlation between these analytes in the Alzheimer's disease group. When we compared the analytes in human neuroscience panel 2 with the established biomarkers in the human amyloid beta and tau kit, we saw that both neurogranin and FABP3 correlated with phospho tau. 
while the significance of these associations is unclear, the take-home message is that multiplexing can expose patterns that may not otherwise be discovered. I would like to transition now to talking about the newest addition to our amino assay portfolio, the SMCX Pro, and its associated kits for single molecule counting. SMC stands for single molecule counting, and the general assay principle is shown in the schematic below. The SMC amino assay follows the same rationale as a traditional sandwich ELISA. With an SMC kit, you have capture and detection reagents that form a, a sandwich complex. <clears throat> the capture antibody is coated onto magnetic beads, while the detection antibody is labeled with a fluorophore. What distinguishes the SMC assay is a proprietary elution step where the sandwich complex dissociates and the individual fluorescently labeled detection antibodies are digitally counted. To get an idea of the typical SMC workflow, I reiterated the assay steps below and included volumes and uh, plate types. So most of the assay setup occurs in a 96-well plate. The initial incubation is 200 microliter volume. Uh, 100 microliters of that is the sample or standard, and the other 100 microliters is the capture bead. The plate is then transferred to a magnet and washed before uh, the addition of 20 microliters of detection antibody, and then uh, incubation to generate the sandwich complex. The plate then goes through a series of washes to remove uh, excess detection antibody <coughs> prior to the elution step. After the elution, the capture beads can be magnetically separated, allowing the researcher to isolate the eluate, which contains the labeled detection antibody. <coughs> this eluate is uh, transferred to a 384-well plate containing the neutralization buffer. After the neutralization step, the assay is ready to be analyzed on an SMC instrument. Currently, our Millipore Sigma SMC kits can be run on two instruments, the ARENA, which is the first generation fluidics driven system, and the new SMCX Pro, which is the second generation platform. The data table highlights the specifications of each system. Both instruments read from a 384 well plate. Some of the improvements to the SMCX Pro include a smaller footprint, uh, so it's a true benchtop instrument, and a more rapid runtime, which allows researchers to run an experiment, generate and analyze data all on the same day, as well as a simplified readout. The ARENA, had took, uh, the ARENA took three measurements, which were detected events, event photons, and total photons. And that produced three standard curves, and it utilized a weighted algorithm to incorporate the three measurements and assign sample values. The SMCX Pro just uses a single readout, which is response, and uh, that is generated by a scanning confocal laser, which surveys the sample walls of a 384-well plate, digitally counting molecules of fluorescently labeled detection antibody. <coughs> we have recently released an SMC kit for the amyloid beta-42 peptide. This kit has been validated in accordance with the benchmarks described earlier for the measurement of uh, amyloid beta-42 in cerebrospinal fluid at a 1 to 20 dilution and in plasma at a 1 to 4 dilution. From the standard curve on the left uh, generated on the SMCX Pro, you can see that the assay sensitivity is not an issue for this kit as the 1 to 20 diluted normal CSF samples overlaid onto the standard curve are falling in the middle of the curve. To give you an idea of the consistency between the SMC instruments, on the right you can see the excellent correlation of these CSF samples when their values were compared uh, between when they were obtained on the ARENA and then on the uh, second generation SMCX Pro. And uh, there's, again, excellent correlation. The bottom figure demonstrates that the 
A beta 42 SMC kit detects the well established decrease of A beta 42 in the CSF of Alzheimer's disease patients. I would now like to review a few points to summarize today's webinar. I hope that it has been instructive regarding the principles and workflow of our milliplex and SMC immunoassays. The data I shared using the Human Neuroscience Panel 2 uh, demonstrates a powerful application of multiplex technology, which is the ability to generate a large amount of data from a small amount of sample. Even though we were working with small sample cohorts, our multiplex analysis allowed us to observe some interesting trends, including some correlations between Alzheimer's disease biomarkers. Hopefully this illustrates the utility of integrating this technology into your neurodegenerative disease research. Finally, our SMC technology enables the measurement of low abundant proteins in biological samples. This sensitivity allows researchers to accurately measure small changes in protein concentration and potentially identify disease before the onset of symptoms. I would like to thank you all for your attention. I would also like to acknowledge several people within the Immunoassay Platform Solutions R&D group at Millipore Sigma, including Xiao Chang, Joseph Huang, Moon Moon Banerjee, Liu Chen, and Sarah Hamron. I would also like to acknowledge members of our marketing and product management team who have worked on these technologies and helped make this webinar possible, including Tina Kornmeyer, Elizabeth Adkisson, Joan Suda, and Marianne Ford. Thanks again. Anthony, thank you for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of our webinar. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your questions into the box that appear on the screen and click that Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's get started and take a look at our audience questions coming in already. Our first question, Anthony, is if this kit can distinguish ApoE isoforms, might this technology also be able to distinguish mutant proteins? Uh, excellent question. Multiplex protein detection can have exquisite sensitivity, making it feasible to distinguish isoforms differing by a single amino acid. There are several instances of mutations associated with neurodegenerative uh, disease, and uh, for example, TREM2 mutations are associated with Alzheimer's. So the ability to measure uh, mutant proteins would be very pertinent for neurodegenerative disease researchers and uh, also very pertinent in the field of cancer research. Uh, the limiting factor for being able to develop an immunoassay specific for a mutant protein is antibody availability. So if there are antibodies specific for the mutant protein, then that would open up the possibility of uh, being able to develop uh, a mutation-specific immunoassay. Thank you, Anthony, and thank you to our audience members, questions coming in. Our next question, can analytes from separate kits be combined into a single assay? Um, the, the short answer is sometimes. There are, uh, are several factors that can kind of feed into the answer. Um, a sample dilution is a key factor. So analytes that vary significantly in abundance will often not have a compatible dilution factor range where they could fit into the same amino assay kit. However, we do have a, a custom assay program and the custom assay team can assess the feasibility of combining analytes from separate kits into a single amino assay, um, a single customized product. So uh, if the combination of analytes is feasible, our custom assay team can expedite the development process and deliver a made-to-order kit. Thank you. We have one more question, and I want to remind our audience members that any questions not answered after the presentation will be answered via email. Our last question is, what if I have a mouse model expressing a human transgene? Will your kids detect the human protein or mouse or both? 
so a kit for detecting human proteins should be able to detect the human transgene expressed in the mouse, uh, provided that the sample matrix is similar. However, uh, some of our pr uh, human protein assays will also be able to detect the homologous mouse protein, and it really varies depending on the analyte. So um, although it wasn't mentioned uh, in my presentation, uh, one of the things we look at during kit validation is an assessment of cross-species reactivity for each analyte. And our technical support team can access this data and then answer specific questions about the cross-species reactivity of individual analytes. Thank you so much. And Anthony, did you want to provide any closing remarks for our audience with our time that we have left together? Uh, no, I'd just like to uh, thank, thank them for their attention. and. Uh, I guess we'll have the uh, email follow-up uh, chat for a more extended uh, Q&A. Wonderful. Thank you. And I want to thank you again for your presentation and LabRoots and our sponsor, Millipore Sigma, for today's presentation. <clears throat> um, just want to remind our audience members before we go that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through June 2018. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when the webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now, and thanks for joining us today. We hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.